Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot La Mode and today on Hot La Mode we are looking at all of the shows you need to know about from London Fashion Week. Now if you guys are looking for a channel that talks about fashion in the most fun, sassy, bitchy, analytical way, this is it. You can go down below, hit the subscribe button and turn on my post notifications. I mean like what do you have to lose? You're already here. And if you guys want to see more from me, you can follow me on any of my social medias linked down below. And you can even check out the Fashion Victims podcast that I do with my friend Darnell Jamal where we talk about the fashion news and gossip you need to know. Before we get any further into the video though, I want to say a huge shout out to today's sponsor who is ExpressVPN. So here's the thing, without ExpressVPN, your data is like a postcard that can be seen by a bunch of different people before it gets to its final destination. But with ExpressVPN, your data is encrypted and essentially sent through a secure tunnel. Similar to putting that postcard into a very, very chic envelope. And that's why I use ExpressVPN, because honestly, I want to keep my data private and I'm sure so do you all. Luckily, ExpressVPN is super easy to use. All you need to do is open it up and click to connect. To find out how you can get three months free of ExpressVPN, click the link in the description box below, which is expressvpn.com slash hot mode. But that's not all. No, I'm not even done yet. ExpressVPN also allows you to unlock blocked content in your country. You'd actually be really surprised by the amount of content that you can actually unlock on streaming services like Netflix, which you can do by changing which country you're connecting from. I'm actually a gigantic Hayao Miyazaki fan. I love movies like My Neighbor Totoro and Spirited Away, and unfortunately they're on Netflix, but they're not available in my area. But with ExpressVPN, I can easily watch those literal classics. So make sure you're protected and unlocking some really cool content with ExpressVPN by clicking the link down below. So thank you VPN, we love ya. And without further ado, let's get into all of the shows that you need to know from London Fashion Week. There are a couple that you really don't need to know about, but it's my job to tell you about them, so sit tight. First up is Shrimps. The brand Shrimps has become synonymous with the anti-fur and faux fur movement, but that doesn't mean they don't have fun with their non-fur fur. The brand is also synonymous with bright colors and patterns, which makes it a lot more of a modern rival of big furriers like Fendi, and this season they came to compete. Apparently Queen Elizabeth was an inspiration as she recently moved away from wearing fur, and the first look was definitely reminiscent of Her Royal Highness. It was a take on a sable coat with large embellished buttons, and then came a few tartan looks, maybe a reference to the Queen's hideaway home Balmoral Castle in Scotland. I will say, between Raph Simmons and Shrimps, could muffs become a trend in 2020? I fell in love with the blue fur coat with the 3D red fabric flowers on it. That blue is as deep as the Mariana Trench and I'm obsessed. Lots of gowns, not all my favorites, but one in neon pink with a beautiful draped shawl neckline was superb, like if the queen was young in 2020. I love the white fur floor length coat with red floral muff and the two finale plaid looks were nice as well. In reality, a nice little outing for shrimps, and who knows, could they become a juggernaut of the fur industry even though they don't produce any fur? Next, let's talk about Kiko Kostadinov. I did quite frankly fall in love with Kiko Kostadinov this season. It is designed by the CSM graduates and twin sisters Laura and Deanna Fanning who I will lovingly refer to as the sisters fanning. Love Ellen Dakota, but they don't design for fashion brands now, do they? Laura and Deanna were looking at fashion in the fifth dimension. And while I don't know what that exactly means, I think the way they manipulate fabrics using shapes and geometry is superb. Firstly, their color blocking is amazing as this brown hound's tooth is made more dynamic by the black shoulders and sleeves. On top of that, the fit is impeccable and I love the diamond cutouts, but not actual cut outs on the kneecaps. I don't even know how to describe the fact that it's like the fabric was forced to create a crater of some sort. And note there is an impression and I love it. I will say the draped square looks and some of the shibori style is rough. Like I love that they're bringing shibori back, which is a style of heating up fabric in order to dye it 
but manipulating it at the same time. The fur curves on a hound's tooth coat punched me in the gut in a good way, but can you be punched in the gut in a good way? I don't know, but it, it felt like that. Then there is a whole slew of looks in all different colors that really plays with geometry, shape, and seams layered on top of each other. And that indent motif sticks around too. The other great thing about the brand is the suiting. It is incredibly sharp and tailored to almost perfection, but adds odd little elements like striped turtlenecks and juxtaposition positioning of fabrics to emphasize the cuffs. Then we got an amazing plaid dress with an open jacket. The knit of the dress gave it waves that you could see as it fell, and the jacket was heat manipulated, which helped make it cascade off the body. Mind you, I will say the sneakers are a bit rough, but I can only assume they are the women's ASICs collaboration, which is known to be less than attractive, so I'll let them slide. All in all, it was a nice collection for Kiko, and I hope to see the sisters fanning continue on their successful little path. Next up, let's talk about Molly Goddard. Fashion's undisputed queen of tool Molly Goddard reminisced on her childhood this season. The collection started with a blue taffeta dress, frilled and pulled and wrinkling, which some may say is a less sheer cousin to her famed tool gowns. It was layered over a sweater though, which could help her potential customers who find her dresses a bit too ridiculous see the diversity their garments could have. Then we got a suit, but not a women's suit, a men's suit, which is new and the first time Goddard has debuted menswear. It was a nice bright plaid suit with a knit cardigan underneath, signifying that men can ditch vests and go straight for the cardigan. There were a few metallic taffeta dresses, one in red and the other in blue, and both had white stripes running along them vertically. It would be interesting to see if Goddard ever started to add prints or color blocking into these larger dresses. Then we got a striped sweater styled over a camo and gingham skirt, which was scary. But then Goddard explored her tool creations with a tool dress styled with a gray zip up knit turtleneck and red tool dress paired with green cardigan. There was a spaghetti strap dress paired with a gray knit sweater, a gray wool wall coat with a blue tool dress underneath, and a simple red tool dress that was fitted at the waist, which felt much more commercial than her usual tool masterpieces. My question about prints was somewhat answered as we got floral prints in sheer dresses, although they didn't have the volume of the usual Goddard gowns. That's what we should call everything, a Goddard gown. But eventually after some rough gingham and camo moments, the Molly Goddard tool dresses you know and love emerged. The first was a yellow dress with the volume starting to build around the waist. It was also paired with a blue and red cardigan and a pair of plaid pants. But the next dress has the volume begin right below the breasts which is considered an empire waistline and is usually used to lengthen the body. In reality, stacking the two looks next to each other, I think the empire waistline version of the dress looks much better and adds more drama. A white strapless taffeta dress was interesting and who knows, maybe Goddard is trying to tap into the bridal market. But I think the spaghetti strap fitted blue taffeta dress was superb. It's fitted at the bust and quite baggy around the waist and the hips, but it's a take I wouldn't have ever really expected to see from Goddard. The finale look was a bit blah though, and the cardigan styling had gotten old by that point, and I was looking for something with a little bit more pizzazz. To be honest, Molly Goddard debuted some nice menswear, explored new silhouettes, and showed how versatile her clothing actually is. Was it revolutionary? No. But was it nice to see her explore the DNA of her brand? Definitely. Next up, let's talk about Richard Quinn. Richard Quinn is a London Fashion Week favorite, as the floral covered masked runway collections have created a bit of excitement amongst the fashion set. And this season was just another great show to add to his portfolio. One which to me is pushing his ambitions to become the creative director of a big French house. The show opened with a slew of embellished garments with models donning face masks, a now signature of Quinn's. These embellishments aren't new, as they've been explored by McQueen and Belmain recently. But regardless, it's impressive to see from such a young brand. McQueen and Belmain have the infrastructure and funds to create such pieces, but it seems that Quinn does as well, which could be a surefire sign that 
the brand is pulling its financial weight. The grid pattern was superb, and I Heart You embellished into the knees was cheeky, which is very much so in line with Richard poking fun at his audience. Then came a baby doll dress with big bouncy bows, another signature of the brand, and another great face mask with a gigantic heart covering the model's face. The final embellished look was a fuller dress that had God Save the Quinn embellished on the back. Obviously, it was a reference to the phrase, God save the queen. It was another cheeky garment that makes you realize that Quinn is creating not only clothing, but a world and inside jokes for those who want to live in it. It's kind of what fashion needs right now. Then we got a striped rugby shirt and satin with darts, which was weird, but then we moved on from a blingy entree to the main course of florals in bouffant silhouettes. First was a black and marigold full coat, tights, shoes, face mask, and a matching head wrap ensemble. And then he took Hound's tooth and crystallized it. And then instead of moving diagonally, which is the direction it traditionally is shown in, it was done vertically to create a slight tweak to the classic pattern. There was a black leather trench coat with spiked face masks, metallic tartan tops, which felt quite menswear-esque, and then a classic gimp bodysuit with a new look style sequin floral dress piped in silver crystals. Cause I mean, listen, whose gimp doesn't want to wear the new look. Then we got a set of floral cocktail gowns with a leg of mutton sleeve in prints that are easily recognizable of Quinn. Then he started to mix the patterns, which might be helpful for customers to see that they can mix their quite over the top pieces with their other quite over the top pieces. But that doesn't mean that it necessarily looks good. Then there was a long floral and polka dot take on the Chinese Chi Pao, which was explored last season as well. But then we got a whole gaggle of non-printed layered gowns and jewel tones. It didn't look great. The issue is the fabric on most of the looks was so visibly wrinkled and they looked like they had been draped just five minutes before the show went on. There was nothing dynamic about any of the looks, except maybe the pink. But in reality, they all felt like been there, done that, flowing layered gowns that we've seen time and time again. And I truly expect better from Quinn. I personally feel like a stiffer or lighter fabric would have worked, but the off the wall satin was yikes for a designer known for so much more. We got feathered jackets over the classic polka dots and floral prints, which if you don't know, Quinn designs all himself. You can actually hear more about Quinn in my Cardi B style breakdown. Mm -hmm, click it, click it, so it's somewhere here, click it. Now, there were even more feathered headpieces this time that framed the face, which to me could be a reference to the Scottish feather bonnets, which were used by the Scottish infantry in the British armed forces. I mean, between the tartan and the feathers, it might not be too big of a stretch. Then we got a bunch of bouffant dresses in the classic Quinn florals, and a strapless version of the polka dot and rose, and a blue and green gown with a balloon shape that nips in at the knees and then creates a mermaid style as well. We got a men's suit in the crystal vertical hound's tooth and honestly hope to see it on a red carpet or two. Then we got some crystallized looks, one a polka dot coat, another a men's striped suit with flare pants, and the last a strapless dress with large crystals. Then we got another balloon dress, but this was different than what we normally see from Quinn. There were crystal foliage stems that whirled around the dress, but the beauty really came in the pink chiffon flower petals that jumped off of the dress that really, really wowed me. Quinn said, bitches, I can do couture. He even topped off his collection with a hooded crystal bride. The embroidery work on the hood is superb and could easily be transferred to a more traditional aspect of a wedding dress, and the champagne color is a nice little touch. All in all, Quinn is telling the world he wants to do something bigger, and honestly, give the bitch the budget, and I'm sure he'd be able to. Victoria Beckham. I don't want to talk about Victoria Beckham too much, because A, her collections are incredibly dull, B, she isn't a designer, and C, well, she just bores the absolute shit out of me. I will also note that she is pretty much the female version of Michael Kors. As in, the collection each season is only as good as the designer she's found inspiration in. Sticky fashion fingers. The collection started in black with a semi-plunging neckline dress. Mind you, it outlined the breast well, but in reality, it's a black dress. Next came a black coat with a true deep plunging neckline and an interesting belt. The buckle is in the shape of two hands touching each other, which from what I've read is called a Victorian hand belt, but I'm not sure. That belt showed up so much throughout the collection and so did these skin tight leather thigh high boots. They pulled that whole collection together. T-B-H. Good styling is good styling, people. Thank God for the boots. There were lots of plaids from dresses to shirts, 
for the modern day lesbian trying to spice it up a little bit, as well as pleated shorts that make you think they were skirts. There were cutout sweaters, which instantly reminded me of the young British designer Stefan Cook, and a bouffant sleeve made me reminisce about the Egyptian inspired Louis Vuitton collection by Nicolas Jesquier. There were plaids, polka dots, and some sleeve action, but I truly would like for someone to find me something in the collection worth having a fashion show for. B, you make Zara knockoffs in luxury fabrics, so let's cut the shit. Stop having fashion shows and forcing Anna Wintour to sit next to your children and husband. And just do a lookbook. It'll make everybody's life easier, cause Lord knows nobody actually thinks you're a good designer. Next up, Simone Rocha. This season, Simone Rocha was inspired by Catholicism and her home country of Ireland. She grew up in Dublin, if you didn't know. But alas, I did not love it. Honestly, didn't even really like it, which sucks, cause Rocha has slowly become one of my favorites. The collection started with an all white look. It was large in silhouette, which is usual for Rocha. The most interesting aspect of the look was the ribbon that stretched around the shoulders of the coat, slipped through the lapels, and tied in a big loose bow in the front. In reality, it's an interesting styling idea that Rocha explored throughout the collection. The coat was also done in white lace, which is a signature fabric for Rocha, but also a very big tradition in the Catholic Church. Women prior to 1983 were required to wear a veil to church, and lace often was a popular choice for those attending. Maybe Rocha has also seen that in recent years, the tradition has become popular amongst modern Catholics. I mean, I did watch a bunch of YouTube videos about it, so like, it's only as popular as the weirdos on YouTube. But unfortunately, the next look described everything wrong with the collection. There is just a lack of editing. That's definitely something I usually think of a Simone Rocha collection. But normally she plays with silhouette and textile in a manner that, you know, pacifies me. But this season, that didn't really happen. Between the tulle, the knits, the satin, the accessories, and the embroidery, it just feels like there is no sense of editing and even the best designers need that. While she also drew inspiration from Riders of the Sea about shipwrecks and drowning, which could be why the look seems so disheveled. But alas, maybe tattered hems and ripped fabric could have showcased that a little bit better. Next was another all white look, although the ribbon tied around the waist actually accentuated it and brought in that I'm a woman of the Regency era, but pregnant. And instead of wearing traditional period dress, I actually wear a really long tunic shirt and pants style that is so signature to Simone Rocha. You should also know the knit rope scarf dangling from the model. The style of knit is actually called an Aran knit and is from the Aran Islands near Galway in Ireland. The Aran knit is famous because of the sweaters that are usually made with them due to the patterns that are created using wool and needles. Many believe that the Aran sweater relates back to the different aspects of life on the Aran Islands, which is now a large tourist site. But unfortunately, we didn't even get an Aran sweater done by Rocha, which I think was the biggest disappointment of the whole collection. I would have loved to see her incorporate modern patterns or maybe even patterns relating to Hong Kong, where her father grew up actually knit into the sweater because that's kind of the whole point of the sweater. It's a sort of historic tool that many from the Iron Islands actually used as a way to identify dead bodies. Yeah, I know. Then we got two looks that were actually quite smart. The use of tool allows the audience to think that these dresses could be off the shoulder as the pleated satin sits across the arms. The white look skirt then flits out at the waist and falls over a pair of white pants, while the black looks had two side panels of black satin fabric that could confuse the viewer into believing that the look had a skirt rather than pants. Rocha continued to add random bits of tulle and also used the ribbon style from the first look. She did that also with a camel coat and pink printed fabric. The asymmetrical cups are strange and the print on the fabric feels a little bit too gaudy for Rocha. And I was even more disappointed in the full dress version in that pink print. There were a bunch of other undesirable looks, but the black tweed helped me get back on track. But it was short lived as floral asymmetrical draped gowns and satin suits littered themselves throughout the collection. Towards the end of the collection, there were these large bouffant styles in light blue, black, and bright blue jacquard that were nice, but I fell in love with the veiled white lace looks. All in all, a bit blah from Simone, but there were still things to enjoy. Let's talk about literal godsend J.W. Anderson. Jonathan Anderson said, go big or go home, or both this season. He wanted to be optimistic this season, and honestly, that shown through fully. I don't really want to discuss the first two looks of the collection as the collection really starts on the third. The gigantic black and white woven coat is truly 
outshined by the leather shawl collar attached. The sheer size of the coat is magnificent and funny, but in reality, it's J.W. Anderson playing with silhouette in a quite exaggerated way, but without making it seem over the top. I mean, of course it's over the top, but like only in shape and silhouette, not textile or pattern or cut. Even the more casual jackets got the oversized treatment, which honestly is perfect for social distancing. Then we got another version of our big coat, this time in a woven camel style with a light beige leather shawl collar. I think the styling of all black underneath allows the coat to stay the focus. And let's be real, that coat is the only thing you're gonna be focusing on. Didn't exactly love the printed draped dress, but I feel like it was a reference to a beer can of sorts cause it mentioned brewers at the top, but I can't be sure. I only drink white wine. Love the black chiffon dress with the shredded white shoulder details. I can't tell what material it is, but it adds real beauty to the dress in an odd way. Next was a large black coat with black pants that had little crystal scrunchies, creating a sort of bell effect at the bottom of each pant leg. It was like taking flaring into your own hands. Could be a little cool styling trick to add to your wardrobe as well. Then an all black version of our big coat came through and Anderson then continued to get more and more experimental with shape. There was a full sparkly knit dress in all different colors with a baggy skirt. I mean, it seems a bit dated with the ruffle neckline, but the silhouette and knit is really interesting. Then a full diamond style satin dress arrives. Anderson was definitely experimenting with 20th century couture shape, hence the drape that creates this almost wing-like aspect of the dress. Are the tinsel sleeves bad? The jury is out. But I know that the Yeti gown of black and brown was truly iconic and I didn't even realize that I was rhyming there. That was hot, Yeti gown of black and brown. It was a black tinsel dress with a brown full skirt underneath that created scoops of ice cream sort of shapes. Love the knit dress with the little shawls and contrasting colors as well. And then we got a Maya blue phi dress with a deep blue tinsel jumping off of it. That created this beautiful blue puffball style that was just truly magical. I love when designers play with silhouette and Anderson is a master. Then a silver and gold ice cream scoop dress appeared and I've never even considered mixing silver and gold till now. A more wearable plaid coat and pants with white tinsel definitely could help out buyers looking for a more commercial aspect of the collection. Love the full shawl look with puffball tinsel tops underneath, which was tied together beautifully with pants. Not obsessed with the paillette dress in blue and silver, nor the other beer can dress. And you can just keep the whole of the ruffle section. It was just truly the Pirates of the Caribbean. If they were all meant to be bottoms, have it. A crystal encrusted wandering line look reminded me of Bowie's famed Kansai Yamamoto jumpsuit, while a gorgeous knit dress, stunning black suit, and blue plaid coat and pant look with white tinsel closed out the show. If Jonathan Anderson was trying to make me optimistic, well, he succeeded and made me laugh while I was at it. Zenze is Christopher Kane. If there was one thing that was evident from this season's Christopher Kane show, it was that triangles were a staple. You could see it in just about everything from coats to dresses to cut out details. The show opened with a coat made of black, brown, and beige triangles, which instantly gave the look a 1970s graphic sort of feel. Next was a satin skirt with a lace triangle bra top with a triangle of lace connecting the skirt and bra. Kane noted that he had been inspired by triangle bras and panties as they are naturally triangle shaped garments. There were some triangle print looks that were unrefined to say the least as they looked a bit fashion design student, but the mixture of the lace and satin was superb. Kane knows how to push the limits. So a pleated high waisted skirt and triangle black lace bra was a great combo as well as a halter style dress with cutouts that were covered by the black lace. Then we started to get some knits and some cutouts, which often created triangles in their own way. And it's very evident to see the man loves a triangle. I don't know why. One pleated dress was in a creamy satin, but that was held by a tiny black lace strap in the shape of a triangle that almost looked like a thong and like thong, 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 thong. Then came a black dress with crystallized jelly bra, 
which was something that Kane explored last season to many in fashion's liking. I mean, who wouldn't want a jelly bra? Then came a cutout sweater, which in reality made two triangles appear at the model's shoulders, and a full black look was accentuated with a green jelly bra. I have also realized that the jelly bras are in fact not attached to the garments, but instead layered over them, which in reality allows there to be a commerciality to the garments, but the ability to also add a bit of fun and raunchiness at the same time, which is very on brand for Christopher Kane. Then came a fully sheer dress with a rib knit turtleneck, which left very little to the imagination and for that, I stand. There was then suits, leather coats, and zebra prints. There was a blue pleated dress and blue jelly straps. And the next look had a blue jelly bra as well with blue jelly heels, because listen, all you need is blue jelly. That gray wool turtleneck and skirt got the jelly treatment as well. There were some sheer dresses, more triangles, and a thong dress in a cool casual black. A bunch of sheer sequin looks emerged and the show finished out with some more lace explorations. Christopher Kane has always explored the outskirts of what is deemed acceptable in fashion, and it always turns into something fun and exciting. And this season, that was done especially. Our last show from the London Fashion Week schedule is Burberry. For some reason, we're supposed to be excited for it, but I never really see the reason why. Riccardo Tisci is known for his dark and sultry time spent at Givenchy, where his Italian roots mixed with his love for American culture that mixed and swirled into a little tornado of neo-goth romanticism. But he's had trouble finding his footing at the heritage British brand Burberry, as he has tried to pander to too many client tribes on the runway. This season was absolutely no different. The show started with trench coat styles that were deconstructed to look as if they were falling off the shoulder, but also had shaggy fur on the shoulders and the sleeves. And no need to fear for those who don't like fur. These coats must be faux as Burberry vowed to eliminate real fur from their production. The suspected faux fur was continued in vests and cardigan form and then Tishi started to jump into leathers as well. Coats were trimmed with leathers and there was a quilted leather vest attached to a jacket. There's this thing about Tishi's Burberry. He's been trying to rework the idea of modern day clothing like suits and t-shirts and pants, but in reality, it's always fallen flat. It always feels like more of a science project, really, rather than a well-constructed garment that is utilizing a current garment style with a twist on its classic component. We then move on to menswear, as Ricardo has been an early adopter of showing men's and women's together, and God knows why you do that. First was a beige trench coat lined with signature Burberry plaid, a tan suit, and square toed dress shoes. Nothing of particular interest. And neither were the rest of the plaid men's looks. Bella Hadid emerged in a keyhole and shoulder cutout dress, which is disappointing as Bella is a bombshell and usually utilized by designers for much better looks. Then Ricardo got the women's wear into the plaid territory, but not in the usual color scheme of the famed Burberry plaid. Like, what? Why? A blue suit that I can only assume was meant to be somewhat dynamic was just a blue suit that was meant to be somewhat dynamic with a ruched waist sash. A green suit, whose color has become a staple for Ricardo's Burberry, didn't really do that much to wow us. Then we got our first look at Ricardo's take on crystal chainmail for the season. It really was just some sort of floral print with a crystal chainmail layered over it. Anything special? No, not really. He then went on to explore cocoon-like shapes in a jacket, coat, and a blazer. A black evening dress emerged in pleats that was actually saved by the plaid sheer detail on the sleeves. I'd love to see that style refined and turned into tops and more commercial wares. The rugby shirt section reminds me of the days when my mother used to think I was straight. For those that know me, you understand how much emotional turmoil that caused me. Ricardo's take on the style had the exact same effect. The nude dress with crystal piping was honestly disgusting and should be burnt and its full silver sister ought to be thrown in a river and sunk to the bottom to never be seen again like the rest of Ricardo's collection. Ricardo, sweetie, what are you doing? That is all from our London Fashion Week reviews. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'd love to see what you guys think in the comments down below. Tell me, were there collections that you loved that I hated or were there collections that I loved and you hated? I'd love to hear about it. So put that in the comments down below. I will see you guys on the next video and TTYL.